Hi everybody. Uh, here are some selected quotes from my posts in this week's discussion. It's week six in LEAD 560. And uh, some of the elements of negotiation are giving a form to each of the viewpoints of the various sides, making sure there is active, engaged listening, having a plan for breaking a tie, or having a neutral third party, making sure that negotiation participants are devoted to beneficial outcomes, and making sure that all views and voices get an ample chance to be heard and understood. When we go into a negotiation expecting only to come out with our own perfect outcome, we're usually setting ourselves up for disappointment. If we instead enter a negotiation with the idea that we don't have all the answers, and uh, rather that we want everyone to come out getting what they can out of the negotiation, Every concession will be in the interest of the goal, a means to a better end. Here are some rules that come to mind that might have solved past issues I've had in negotiations. Uh, no more than one person can speak at a time. No hitting below the belt verbally, in other words, name calling, uh, calling other ideas stupid, etc. Uh, each point of view should have equal time to speak with the option of giving up time for another's view. That would be kind of nice if somebody gave me some of their extra time. Uh, things regarded as fouls should be able to be noted with some sort of quiet motion, like a yellow flag or a raising of hands or something. And uh, they should be able to be acted upon by the ever-present neutral party. Uh, either party should have the opportunity to call a five-minute timeout at any time uh, to avoid tensions or outbursts that might irrevocably harm relations. Uh, in other words, instead of us getting so stressed out that we end up screaming e at each other, we should be able to walk away for a few minutes from a negotiation. Uh, depending on the level of the importance of the issues at hand, a contract to abide by in the negotiation could be drawn up and signed by all the interested parties. There should be clear values and penalties for positive and negative actions defined in the agreement. Uh, people often take statements of things like price, grade, pay, rules, and definitions at face value and expect that they are factual and immovable. Uh, there are certain contexts and environments where price negotiation is expected and warranted, such as a yard sale, garage sale, flea market, etc. But when you walk into a Walmart or a Sears and you see a price tag on something, you expect to pay the price that is on the price tag. You don't expect to be able to um, go to the manager, for for instance, and say, how about if you give me uh, $10 off on that vacuum cleaner? Apparently, there are uh, retail organizations where that does happen, but um, I don't think I really knew that. So thank you, Tim. Uh, based on my past experiences, the two most common perception problems I've had are a lack of intent listening amongst negotiation participants and a closed mind uh, amongst negotiation participants. Everybody wants to believe that what they have in their mind is correct, that their perception is the only correct perception. Having a perception is a given. Everyone has their existing perceptions, but if you, for instance, number one, never try to hear dissenting or differing opinions from your own, or number two, choose to never allow your perception to be modified, then in my experience your perceptions will get in the way of a successful, fruitful negotiation. Some safeguards you might employ to combat these issues are to insist on rules that, number one, respect and enforce the act of listening, such as not having any interruptions, not allowing uh, phone calls to be taken during negotiations, having timed responses, no side conversations during statements, etc. Or number two, we could do as Mark Grazan suggests in his uh, book, Leading uh, Through Conflict, and implement some inquiry in order to find some common ground, which will help parties to see that there are things that bind people despite their differences, and which may create opportunities for opening minds with set perceptions. Uh, logically, there is probably little reason not to commit to inquiry without, I'm sorry, Commit to inquiry about any unknowns in your work life. In other words, if you don't know something in your job, you should ask a question in order to find out what the answer is. Um, however, emotionally, getting answers to questions can be disappointing, surprising, 
and can confirm um, things that you don't know to be true but that you fear might be true. For instance, um, I may believe in my heart that my leader may not want to or be able to give me a raise. Uh, I may also wish to enjoy the hopeful feeling that she may actually be able to and want to. Uh, I may actually rather think that it's possible than to know that it's not. In other words, um, not knowing has a certain comfort in it compared to knowing. Uh, but if we don't ask, we don't know. Thanks very much for a great week. Talk to you soon.